opportunity to welcome you to the James Dunn Theater here on the beautiful Kennedy campus um, for session two of 2018's Mini Medical School. How many of you, by show of hands, were here last week? A lot of you, great. Well, those of you who weren't able to join us last week but are here now, welcome. We're happy to have you join us. Uh, last week's presentations were focused on sleep, uh, which I don't know about you, but I could use a little more of, uh, and skin. Uh, this week we have Dr. Philip Cho talking about holistic medicine and the aging population, and Dr. Teresa Harbath talking about the aging brain. Uh, I'm not going to make a joke about that. Uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, I think we, uh, I really want to uh, thank you for being here. I think that in this age where our physical environment is creating uh, or is facing many challenges, which often uh, trickle down to our health issues, uh, and in an age where increasingly we need to uh, embrace and champion science and scientific thought uh, and, uh, and research, um, the Mini Medical School program is a wonderful opportunity for the community to come together uh, and to have uh, meaningful, uh, thoughtful presentations and discussion uh, on important and timely issues based in science. And so thank you for being here for that. And I really want to thank a few folks for uh, helping to put this program together. Uh, there are a lot of staff uh, from community education, from health sciences, um, our SCOM students, uh, the Emeritus students of College of Marin, a number of community members, our health science students, some of whom are here today, uh, helping to chaperone. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. I'd also like to thank some donors who made this uh, possible with their financial support, the Hattie Fund, the J. Pritzker Foundation, and a number of individual donors. Let's give them a round of applause. And of course, a big thank you uh, to an individual who's, without whom this program here on this campus uh, would not happen. Uh, and we are very fortunate uh, to have the, uh, the passion, uh, the unending um, energy, uh, and the vision of Dr. Eva Long, the president of our board of trustees.
Dr. Cho's lectures of critical importance to our health and welfare. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Philip Cho. Well, let's try some, you know, let's just, just try some traditional medicine. 
And so they started experimenting with a combination of what they called modern science with a traditional Chinese medicine, like acupuncture, uh, incense, and, and moxa, and cupcake, and everything like that. And that wasn't getting it better. Ultimately, they said, you have to go to America, because they don't think you're going to get Luckily, my parents had applied for visas three or four years before I was even born. Uh, and it wasn't until I was eight years old we finally uh, were accepted and read the States. And so that was my introduction and awareness of acupuncture and, 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 and other forms of medicine. So fast forward forwarding to now where I said, oh, you know what? There's got to be another form. There's got to be another way. Maybe there is, but no one's really looking at us. And that's why I went to osteopathic medicine. Osteopathy is a, it, it's, it's traditional medicine as, as any, any of that you will encounter. Uh, but in addition, we look at the musculoskeletal system and, uh, and, and the way that the body works. And we, we believe our foundation is based upon this, this fact that the body has the ability to heal itself if you give it a chance. Yeah. Right? And so, so that's why I pursued it. But even in an osteopathic school, the majority of graduates currently, well, less than 20% actually practice osteopathy. Most of them continue to follow the same allopathic trend of sub-specializing in something else and completely ignore what they learned. So that's a, that's a long trend. Even in osteopathic school, my exposure to complementary medicine was one lecture in four years. One lecture. But that one lecture is more than any allopathic school provides in medical school today. And I know because I'm teaching it at Stanford Med School. And I don't see it. So why is that? So uh, we'll, we'll talk about, so today's point of view is, is it's coming from my, my eyes, so please, I don't represent Stanford right now, I don't represent the Palo Alto. Holistic medicine is in quotations for a reason, because of the fact that this is my understanding of what holistic medicine is. If you talk to any of your primary care providers right now, whether they're Jerry Christian or not, they'll probably say that they practice holistic medicine. But everyone has a different understanding of what that is, don't we? I'm sure you have a version of what holistic medicine is. I'm not here to, today to say that one way is better than I'm going to be talking about some products, uh, some supplements, some medications. I'm not saying one is superior. I'm just asking that you have an open mind today and just hear me out and make a decision for yourself as to what you think may or may not be appropriate for you. Okay? So, here are today's objectives. I just want to quickly define for you what complementary medicine is. I want to introduce some basic concepts of aging that's related in terms of medication usage. And I want to talk to you, I want to review some of the articles and uh, some of the journals out there uh, discussing this topic in the aging population. Now, you have a packet in front of you. I have to put a lot of information because they're going for credits for the nursing students. Don't worry about it. There's no way I can cover all of this. Um, but I, you guys feel free to read on your own afterwards, but I just ask for your attention right now. Okay, that's good. All right. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Malcolm Gladwell. His latest book, what? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Maybe it's just you and me. Uh, his latest book, it's not that new now, uh, is uh, David and Goliath. And in this book, he really challenges the reader to re examine your understanding of what an advantage is.
Is it glitter? <laughs> it um, well, geez, a lot of questions. That's all I can ask. Uh, what was that? Oh, yeah, Vivek. So, Vivek begged the government and they allowed him to come to MIT and he became an engineer and ultimately came to the Bay Area and started a small company called Typical Software. And by small, I mean a multi million dollar industry in Palo Alto. He became a uh, part owner of the Golden State Warriors. Anyone fans? <laughs> also, is currently now the, the part owner of the Sacramento Kings, but that's not the reason why he is mentioned in the book. He's mentioned in the book because of his success with his youngest daughter's seventh grade basketball team. And you see, Vivek growing up in India had no idea what basketball was. He's used to cricket, used to soccer. But his youngest daughter was so thirsty for playing basketball with her friends. They needed a coach in Northern City. They needed a team. So Vivek said, sure. I don't want to disappoint my daughter. So he studied, he studied basketball as much as he could. And, ah, silly. And um, he, he watched film and, and it was puzzled because I'm sure many of you know how basketball is played, right? You have team A that starts off on one end, dribbles up the court, pretty much uncontested to the other side where team B is trying to play defense and prevent you from scoring. Then team B gets the ball, goes to the other side of the court, uncontested, and then they try to score. So Vivek was wondering, why is it that you have 94 feet to play and yet you're only playing in half of the city? Why are you giving the team already a 50% chance to have a higher success to score? And so he started asking all these people, why, why are we doing it? And the common response is, that's just how we do it. It's, it's too hard to play the entire length of the field. It's, it's too much effort. It doesn't make sense. But Vivek was confused, so he said, forget it. Everyone's saying that this isn't going to work, so I'm going to use that strategy called the full court press, where he, what he inherited what he labeled as a bunch of younger, shorter, clearly not talented girls against the far superior teams. And he used that, he implemented the strategy of playing the entire court of defense to a point where they would sometimes be up 25 to zero by the end of the first quarter. And he took them to the national championships. <laughs> this is a guy who doesn't even know what basketball looked like when before his daughter approached him. And so he saw something that other people were overlooking. He saw what a disadvantage, what other people called a disadvantage, and said, why can't it be an advantage? And this is very similar to medicine, and that's why I bring it up. You see, again, four years of schooling in, in the States taught me that there's only really one form of medicine. In fact, there's so much information, most of us would get overwhelmed and even can't, can't study. The, the running joke in med, med school is that before you graduate, you have to choose one. You could be a generalist where you know a, very little about a lot of things, family practitioner, internal medicine, and hospitalist, or you can know a lot, very little, a specialist like a pulmonologist or a cardiologist. You can't be both. That's impossible. So you've got to choose. Unfortunately, too many people are choosing the specialty, and that's why we don't have enough general practitioners right now, right? Uh, which is more evident by the fact that this one is terrible, isn't it? How many of us are sick? Anybody sick? My wife right now has the flu. She's been sick for the past week and a half. My youngest daughter has croup that just started two weeks. I'm going on two nights without sleep right now because my daughter's vomiting mucus nonstop. And I'm exhausted because my oldest goes to Korean school. I just had to drop her off right before this. And the Korean homework is so hard, I don't even know it anymore. <laughs> so if I'm slurring, I'm not having a stroke. I'm not having a stroke. I'm not having a sleep. Just so, you know, I'm a little tired. But it's okay. It's okay. But medicine, modern medicine was originally designed and founded on the basic principle of cure that acute, short-term, single-episode disease process. And then as we started getting smarter, we realized, hey, disease isn't just a single-time episode, it's, it's a complex system. And so we started creating these subspecialties in medicine. And we got more and more subspecialized, so focused on one disease, so most of our physicians are forgetting about everything else. There's just too much information to know about just one single disease. And it's coming at the cost of fragmentation of healthcare delivery. How many of us have so many specialists that they're not even talking to each other? We have EMR, but we don't, they don't really talk to each other. In 
fact, they're so focused on their own specialty, they're forgetting that. What if there is a possibility that another way exists to help treat your symptoms or your disease? Why are we so focused on one side of the court and completely ignoring that there is an existence of another system? So, if you look at the data, the use of complementary medicine is on the rise. In fact, the highest users of complementary medicine right now is the age group of 55 to 64, or 45 to 64. But if you think about it, in a few years, that, that group will become the 65 and older, right? In fact, in 2052, for the first time in US history, you will have more people in the United States who are over the age of 65 than, than less than 18 years old. Okay, that means we're living longer, we're not producing enough babies. Nobody wants babies anymore. <laughs> to, uh, to recognize this trend and finally start to accept the fact that maybe there are other solutions, Congress in 2014 completely changed the concept of the National uh, Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which is housed under the National Institute of Health, to, na the, to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. And you're thinking, oh, what does it matter? Well, it's actually pretty significant in the scientific world. You see, complementary medicine, alternative medicine specifically, has a very negative connotation in the scientific community. Alternative medicine uh, is, is viewed as non-scientific, unproven uh, methods of substituting for traditional and conventional means. And, um, and because of that negative connotation, even in med school, we're kind of like, eh, don't use that stuff. It's not proven. Don't even entertain it. That's how they're training U.S. Uh, physicians. But the term integrated means that rather than saying that we're replacing one thing over the other, let's start viewing it as why not use the two to see what advantages we can get. It's, it's divided into three major categories right now under the NIH. And, and as you can see up there, it's, it's natural products, mind-body practices, and other forms. The, while some of the evidence is still lacking to meet the strict uh, evidence-based medicine criteria, it is still at least starting to become more recognized. Not utilized, but at least recognized. And that's actually a big step in this country. Oh, So, in, in 2007, there was a, a nationwide survey of 30,000 plus uh, U.S. adults over the age of 18. They just wanted to see how, how many people you know, utilize complementary integrated medicine, which I'll refer to as CIM. And the surveys consistently showed, again, that the most frequent users were 45 to uh, 64. Can you guess what the most frequent form of CIM is for those who are 65 and older? Prayer. Self-prayer was the number one in 2007. The number one form of complementary integrated medicine. Prayer and self-healing. It didn't mean that there were spirit, you know, a particular religion or whatnot. A more recent AARP uh, study, uh, conducted a study for those who are 50 years or older. And it had about 1,100 1, people. And they found out that for those who are 65 and older, the most common form of CIM is now natural, uh, herbal remedies, and vitamins and supplements. Followed by the use of a chiropractor or some kind of manipulation of body mind techniques. Uh, more than 50% of those who are 70 years and older were at least on one supplement, utilized in the past 12 months and continuing to do so. Ah. So, there's a, <laughs> so there's a growing a trend of usage that we see, and all the studies are showing it. But what do we really know about these new products? These products have been on the market forever, but have they been studied under the same set of guidelines as any other medications that we receive as a prescription? It depends what you're looking, you're looking at. One year it's good, one year it's bad. Look at coffee. They told me coffee was great two years ago, so I started drinking 10 cups. And then the following day, they said, oh, you can't drink too much coffee. So I'm like, oh, back down to one. 
Chocolate is good. Yay! Oh, wait. The following year, dark chocolate only. Oh. The studies keep on changing, right? In fact, for every article that I do a search for in the national database, for every good article, I can find a counter argument. This isn't just limited to supplements. This is true about any medication that you may be taking. Now, we, we're getting better and better at teasing out the good studies from the bad studies. But the fact of the matter is, we don't fully understand how these products work. I could go to China and ask the same question, and they would still say, there are some theories, but nothing truly proven yet. But what we do know is that as we age, and we start combining one supplement with another supplement, combine one supplement with another medication, there seems to be some effect for some, not all. There, there are people who will tell you that supplements and herbals, etc., are completely safe. Some of our medications are based upon these plants, right? And, and natural products. But to say that they're completely safe is dangerous. And so anyone who says that, I would be hesitant to fully believe them. And the reason for this is because more and more we're starting to see that even the things that you buy at Costco on a bulk price is still going to have some adverse effects if you combine it with certain medication. CoQ10, some of you may be on CoQ10. Again, don't raise your hand and say, oh, I'm not going to use this anymore, because you're going to even know. And that's not what I'm saying. But CoQ10, some of our patients are just going on it because they hear the radio ads or the TV ads saying how great it is a miracle drug for everything. But they're on a medication called warfarin, a blood thinner, or whatever the case may be, typically atrial fibrillation, a rapid heart rhythm that can cause a lot. And they have more and more bleeds. In fact, one of our patients fell, hit his head. Warfarin alone should, is going to cause you to bleed, but the bleeding was even more excessive because of the combination of the supplement and warfarin. So this is just one example of what we're noticing. Salt Some of you may be using it, have used it, or considered using it. So in early late 90s and early 2000s, Salt Palmetto was published in almost major, every major uh, uh, medical journal saying that, hey, we found something, and it works. It's, it's uh, a natural remedy that we, we, we recommended uh, for the use of an enlarged prostate for men, particularly those with post void dribbling and not urea, which is basically you know why men get up late at night three, four, five times a night to go to the bathroom. And so they go on medications like finasteride, which is ProStar, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And they did a study and they said, hey, salt palmetto works just as well as ProStar finasteride. It's cheaper. There's a side effect. Why not use it? We're not seeing any. We're not using seeing any harm. So back in 2000, we were prescribing. We're saying use salt palmetto. Use salt palmetto. Everything's great. And then we started getting reports of, hey, why is this guy getting pancreatitis? He's just on salt palmetto. Okay, that's a rare except That's a rare case. But it still does happen for that individual. It's not rare if it happens to you, right? What's always funny is, oh. Risk is less than 2%. Tell that to the person who's actually suffering from that. They're not happy. So the, the bottom line was in early 2000s, everyone's like, promote it. 10 years later, they're like, eh, maybe we should hold off on that. Because now with, with further research and cons comparing it to placebo, meaning that, you know, giving them a lot of sugar pill without them knowing, the benefits didn't improve. Now, again, I'm not here saying that salt palmetto doesn't work for everyone. For some of you, it may be working. And if it is, great, use it. If it doesn't work for you, stop it. If you're considering using it, talk with your doctor to make sure that the active ingredients don't interact with what you're currently taking. That's all I'm asking. But I'm asking that you don't just say, forget it, I'll never try this, it's never going to work for me. And the reason why I bring that up is because the latest data indicates that the majority of our patients do not voluntarily offer their use of CIM with their physicians. Many of them feel embarrassed. Many of them simply don't tell the doctor because, and this is the this is the cardinal sin that I cannot accept in my medical school students. They don't ask the patients. When's the last time your primary care provider or any doctor asked you what over-the-counter supplements are you taking? Right? We're so busy in that 15-minute encounter, 
writing everything down with the nurses, saying, this is all I take. The doctor quickly looks at it and then goes, okay, well, can I help you? If you're, you're lucky if they take their eyes off the computer while they're typing and talking to you, right? Yeah. And then, and then they move on and say, okay, I'll see you in a year. But the fact that the majority of our patients do not tell us this information is very concerning, concerning and alarming because of the fact that there is this common misconception for some reason that these things are regulated. They're not. Okay? More than half of our patients believe that there's some governing body overlooking how, how safe these products are, and they aren't. And more importantly, Doctors, like I said, I told you, how many lectures did I have in complementary medicine? One in four years. Allopathic. I don't know. But what we do know is that as our body ages, there are changes that do occur that we need to be more aware of. There are scientific facts that people can't dispute. And that's what we're going to really go over today. But before I do, I wanted to share with you one of the cases that we, we saw. Uh, this is one of my colleagues. So she, this, we had a new patient transferred from a primary care physician to the geriatric uh, team. Uh, she had seen her endocrinologist because she had a series of symptoms. She, she was overweight and obese, but mainly abdominal fat. And her abdomen had these, what looked like stretch marks, but we call striding, you know, her purple discoloration linings in the abdomen. She had really dry skin, she had high blood pressure, her bones were brittle and weak, and as a result, Put it together, it's Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease is a disease of overproduction of steroids that cause harm to your body. And so the endocrinologist was like, this is easy. She has Cushing's. Let's get, let's get surgery and remove her adrenal glands. So, so this patient was seen in our, in our clinic uh, for uh, pre-surgical consult. And then my colleague asked her, oh, okay, well, thank you for listing your medications, listing for blood pressure, acetaminophen, Tylenol for arthritis, calcium and multivitamins for bone health. And then all she did was do her job and say, oh, are you taking anything over the counter? And she's like, yeah, I'm taking this thing that my neighbor told me about. She got from China, it's supposed to be good for my bones and pain, and it's, it's actually helped me a lot in terms of my pain. So they said, we said, hey, bring it in. You know, we have another two, follow, two week follow up, so why don't we bring in that medication so we can look over the ingredients? And what we found out was that after much translation, there were pig adrenal glands, adrenal glands that produce cortisol. She was taking excessive amount of steroids, which were mimicking the symptoms and signs of Cushing's disease. And she was about to go to surgery to remove her perfectly working adrenal glands. All because nobody asked her, what else are you taking? Anyone recognize this? Mel Gibson. 80s? I think this came out in the late 80s. I don't know. I didn't speak English back then, so I have no idea. I just saw the commercial. But it was an entertaining commercial because you know what happens is um, there's a, a group of federal agents in tactical gear. They break down the door of a mansion, beautiful mansion, walk down the corridor and up the stairs into the kitchen. Now, I don't know any, I guess mansions have kitchens on the second floor. I don't know why. Um, and then as the federal agent said, freeze, you see Mel Gibson turn around and say, oh, it's just vitamin, vitamin C. In the late 80s and early 90s, there was a growing concern among, amongst the US population that their right and privilege to purchase vitamins and supplements were being jeopardized because the FDA wanted to get involved. FDA wanted to regulate, label these products as drugs. And if they do that, then they could put all of these supplements and dietary products uh, under the same scrutiny as any other medication. And as a result, they, the, the, the public was complaining and complaining and complaining. So in 1994, uh, under the Clinton administration, uh, they, passed, um, they passed the Dietary Herbal, uh, Dietary Herbal Supplement and Education Act, which prohibited and still prohibits the FDA from regulating these products. There's a law that prevents the FDA from regulating these products. The FDA is not allowed to scrutinize these products, and the manufacturers of these, uh, of these products aren't required to provide proof that the products that they sell actually do what they claim to do. And if you notice all of the ads and all the labels that says that not FDA regulated, they cannot legally claim that they cure anything. And so the word cure is never used purposely on these ads. 
But they can say they can treat some of these symptoms. That's all they have to say. They don't have to prove anything. So, can we trust this supply? <laughs> so obviously, the scientific community is like, hey, let's just see what it looks like. So in 2013, they, uh, one group study uh, published a study uh, that using uh, DNA biomarkers to detect the, the actual active ingredients, they collected 44 of the highest selling herbal supplements from four major retailers, Walgreens, Walmart, Target, and uh, GNC. And that represented 12 manufacturers. And what they found was that less than half of the products had the actual active ingredient. Most of the products, over 60%, contain cheap substitute filters, powdered rice, asparagus, household plants, things that some people were allergic to and had an allergic reaction by taking it. Only two out of the 12 companies actually produced everything that was on the list. Two. And so, and there was a big New York Times article that said, like, oh, why are, why are people doing this? The public still doesn't understand. It's not regulated. This is a big market out there. So if you're not well informed, you might be taking nothing but uh, a sugar pill. But what if it's working for some people? Hmm. Possible placebo effect. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But all of this thing, what this does is it just continues to build the skepticism that's pervasive among the healthcare community. And in return, it, it makes our society less and less willing to be open minded about these products. And we're com com we start to completely ignore something that's actually effective in some cases and never give it a chance. Anyone know this guy? I get questions about him all the time. Him and Dr. Phil. Uh, they call me Dr. Phil, and I'm like, no, I'm not the ball guy. Um, I actually really respect Dr. Voss. He's one of the best cardiac thoracic surgeons in the country. Um, I respect him as a TV uh, celebrity. He's great, he's entertaining. But at one point, I can never deduce when science and, and fiction begins, because he mixes it so much. In 2012, he started promoting this dietary su uh, supplement. I think it was some kind of green coffee tea extract that was his miracle weight loss drug. He said, you can lose 17% of your body fat regardless, regardless of your body habits in 22 weeks. You don't even have to exercise. Wow! <laughs> Sign me up. So a bunch of people started buying it, and the FTC had to get involved because they got so many complaints. Hey, but Dr. Oz said it was good, right? So why is it not working? And so Congress called him up and said, hey, do you know what you're saying? He's like, yeah, but I know that some of the uh, stuff that I promote on my TV wouldn't stand a chance against the rigors of the scientific community. But I think it works. It doesn't help, does it? Right? <laughs> this is more ammunition for, the, for, for those unwilling to accept that there may be a possibility. So well, again, I'm talking about a lot of these things mainly because of the fact that, as I've already alluded to, we are spending more and more time and money and resources on medications. So we have to understand what polypharmacy is, which is one of the geriatric symptoms that I mentioned earlier on. Polypharmacy is the use of many medications. Very simple, right? In the U.S., polypharmacy is defined as using five or more, five or more medications. And in that five, herbals, over-the-counters, and supplements do count. The body doesn't distinguish whether a medication was a prescription medication or if it was bottle of the counter. Whatever you put in your mouth, it has to be absorbed, it has to be broken down, it has to be eliminated. Right. Polypharmacy leads to a lot of problems such as inappropriate use of medications. I can guarantee you that there will be at least half of you who are on medication and you have absolutely no idea why you're taking it. You just say it's because somebody told me to. Some of the doctors don't even know why you're on it. They never ask you. We see that quite often. Some of you are on the same class of medication to treat the same problem. Why are you taking Nexium and Prilosec? It's the same thing. But the use of these medications on chronic use, now we're seeing that leads to uh, pneumonia, kidney damage. Now it's starting to show that it's associated with dementia. It's sold over the counter. There's inappropriate use of medication. Just yesterday, we had a case at Stanford Children's Hospital 
where the mother just bought children's uh, Tylenol and we gave her child because she was having some fevers for about a week. And then the child went to little family because rather than using the infant dosing, she used the children's dosing, not realizing there was a difference in the concentration of the medications all over the child. Along with polypharmacy, we have to talk about prescription testing. And this is something that's very, it's, it's a pendulum shift for all my fellows that come to train at Sanford. You see, patients come to our clinic with a problem. And the geeky sides of us say, oh, there's a problem, I know what the answer is, I know which medication you want, we'll treat that. So we're so eager to write a prescription. But in reality, the problem and the symptom that the patient is coming in for is due to the fact that they were on a the medication just before it. The most common example is happening right now, and we're seeing it more frequently. People have the flu or some kind of cold, they started taking ibuprofen, they took too much of it, they started having stomach pain, but they think it's heartburn, they go buy a proton pump inhibitor like Nexium or Microsol uh, or, or Prilosec. And then you start to see more and more symptoms. You see, rather than saying, hey, here's a problem and a symptom, let me give you a drug. Why can't we start thinking, hey, here's a problem and a symptom. Did we cause it? And would removing something actually improve? It's a very different way of thinking. We're training all these physicians to say, problem, 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 get a solution, 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 as opposed to problem, 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 what can we take away? 91% of those who are over 65 are at least on one prescription medication. 65 and older, population makes up 13% of the U.S. population, but they are 33% uh, cons of the consumers of prescription medication. Almost 50% of all order herbals and over-the-counter supplements are bought by those who are 65 and older. So we're spending a lot of money, guys. As we age, we know that studies show that there's a greater probability of you using one more medication. 20 and 40 percent of you will be the 70 will be on 45 medications at least. That's counting over the counters and supplements. The highest users of polypharmacy, more than 10 medications, are uh, women uh, in their 70s, uh, mid 70s and early 80s. This is a growing trend. Why is that? <sighs> polypharmacy prescription cascade is also tied in with what we call adverse drug events. An adverse drug event is an unintended negative consequence to the use of medication. What's alarming is the fact that for those who are 65 and older, one out of every five patients that we as physicians prescribe a medication for will come back to the hospital or to the doctor because of an unintended side effect, even though the medication is perfectly appropriate. Which means that we still don't understand how drugs interact with other drugs in your system in an individual level. 20% of our patients go back because of what we did, even though we had the right intention. In fact, if you count adverse drug event as one of the, <laughs> and, and quantify it as a disease, it's the fifth leading cause of death for those who are 65 and older. Those who are 65 and older are seven times more likely to be hospitalized because of an adverse drug event compared to their younger counterparts. If you go to the emergency room, there's a 50% chance that you'll come up with at least one new medication that's going to continue to con uh, to continue the prescription cascade and thus worsen the polypharmacy issue. I'm not here to scare you to say don't take medications. Please don't get that idea in your hands. I'm just saying, you have to be cautious and make sure that, that everyone knows what you're taking and what the drugs are you buy. <coughs> In, in geriatrics, and I talked about, a little bit about this, there's this concept of homeostenosis. And, and I'll talk about, a little more about it in the next slide. But basically, as we age, science has shown us that there's the greatest amount of intervariability amongst every individual here. How one person reacts to one medication is completely different from how the next person sitting next to you reacts to that same medication. Because of the increasing prevalence of disease, and every one of us have different diseases. The amount of medicines that you take over the counter or prescription. And we just can't predict who's going to react to how and when and where and why because of this concept of called homeostenosis. Homeostenosis is just a creative word that Jerry has created that combines homeostasis, which is one's ability to maintain balance and equilibrium, and stenosis. And stenosis. 
What you simply need to know, maybe you've heard of the term carotid stenosis, the narrowing of the artery over here by your neck that supplies your brain. So homeostenosis uh, is a theory in which every organ in your body and every individual is born with a set of reserves to allow you to maintain homeostasis when you're introduced or, or exposed to some kind of a stress to your body. Your physiologic reserves allow you to go back to your baseline, and so you don't feel the effects of it. As we age, however, this line, which represents the physiologic limit, starts to decline, can't be replenished. And our organs start to not interact well with each other. You will actually get to a point where it's low enough that the same thing that had no severe consequences for you when you were much younger, will now go across the threshold and prohibit you from returning to your baseline. That's what we call frailty. And it's once you enter that stage, you're getting closer and closer to the end of your life. This is the concept of homeostasis. This is all theory. We haven't proven it. But this is what we're seeing in medicine. So let's talk about things that, that we actually know and understand, right? So what we do know is that there are biological changes that occur. The two key concepts are referred to as pharmacodynamics, which is the way that the drug affects the body, which we don't really know. As we eat, we know for a fact that we're more sensitive to the medications that we take. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. But we know more about pharmacokinetics. It's actually easier to study. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the medication. So, pharmacokinetics is broken down into absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. You can read all of this on your own. But the main important point here is the fact that as we age, our ability to absorb a medication decreases due to the reasons listed above. Uh, some of you may be on a medication called a, a group of medication called bisphosphonates, Fosamax, Alendronate, that's the most common one, taken once a week. And you should have been told that you're supposed to be sitting upright nothing else for 30 minutes and just wait. It's one of the hardest medications to get compliance with. And what's more alarming is the fact that less than 2% of the medication is absorbed by the body if you're completely healthy. Less than 2%. That's why we really have to make sure you're not doing anything else to sit up straight. 30 minutes. Don't even move. You can breathe over. 2%. That's for a normal healthy human being. Distribution, as we age, we lose our muscles and it's replaced with fat. We lose water. And I'm sure the dermatologist last week told you that's why your skin is the way it is. So that we go from looking like this. I know we all look like that. <laughs> and then we become that. Okay? You could be super fit, trying to cheat with steroids, but you can't trick time. And that is what happens. But why is that important? This is important to understand because because of the normal natural aging process, medications have different effects. Some of you have maybe on a medication called digoxin to help some of your heart failure or arrhythmia. It's a medication that's fat soluble. It's a medication that's stored in muscle. But because we lose, we lose a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's water soluble. But because we lose both water and muscle as we age, it's more active in the bloodstream. And that's why you need a lower dose than when you need it when you're 20 years younger. Some of you may be on a medication called benzodiazepines. And I'm, like, I'm not a big fan of it. If you need it, there's better be a good reason for it. Xanax, right? Lorazepam, Aladapam, etc. These are fat soluble medications, and because we have more fat, they stay in our system longer. And so, even though you may not have received the benefits right away because you've been taking it for so long, it's harder for your body to eliminate it. And so, you suffer from the consequences of it more and more as you age. Metabolism. Uh, most of our medications are broken down by the, by the liver, and there's a specific system which you don't need to know the exact details of. But the liver shrinks in size as we age. 
blood flow to the liver decreases. And this all impacts the ability of your body to clear all, anything that you ingest. Medications then have to be eliminated out of the body for the kidney system. And it has to be in a normal kidney, in a naturally aging kidney, it shrinks in size. It functions in crime. And then you add on what's referred to as chronic kidney disease that some of you may have heard of. And it's going to expedite this process. And so you're going to, again, have difficulty eliminating the medications, whether it's prescription or non-prescription. So all I want you to know is that you need to start becoming familiar with the medications, but more importantly, the supplements that you're taking, because I can guarantee you the majority of your physicians have no idea what you do. And so it's your job to inform the physicians what you're taking and ask them and challenge them to can you make sure that the medication and the supplements I'm taking are not interacting with each other to cause possibly a symptom that you're complaining about right there and then? In, in pediatrics, we base all of our medication based on their weight. In geriatrics, we base all of our medication due, uh, to, relative to your decline in kidney status. So what you're taking maybe 10 years ago may not be the same dosage as what you're taking now. In the scientific community, because there's a growing concern, you always have to be aware of the types of studies that there are because we want to make sure that the facts are straight, that the data is, is, is solid, there's no compromise. The New England Journal of Medicine is one of the most uh, is one of the prestigious uh, journal articles out there in the medical community. In 1999, they published a study called the RAILS trial. And the RAILS trial is, it was a study conducted for those with congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure was is one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality, and it's very expensive for the healthcare system. So they, did, they, so they designed a study that combining two medications, an ACE inhibitor along with the spironolactone, actually decreased morbidity and mortality, but more importantly, it decreased hospital readmission rates. So all every system was happy. It was so important, in fact, that it was published online in 1999. 1999, who had internet access? Not many. It's AOL dialogue. Remember AOL? But because it was so important, it had to be published online, every physician said, hey, we got to do this. Most practitioners didn't really read the details of the study, but they noted that, hey, only less than 2% complications, mainly what's called hyperkalemia, too much potassium in the body because of the medications. That's acceptable. Less than 2% is always acceptable in the scientific community. And so they, they, they published the study. And what happened right after? What they projected would be the amount of prescription of the combination drugs was surpassed by fourfold the subsequent year and a half. The projected and accepted rate of risk was here. Mortality and morbidity all skyrocketed in the aging population. The study was conducted for those predominantly in their 50s, and yet what happened was that I have to work for a 55-year-old. Why can't I work for a 75-year-old? was a mentality, and this is what happened. So you see, we don't really understand the drugs and the aging body completely. We make a lot of assumptions, and sometimes it's detrimental. So we developed a, a term called pharmacovigilance, where you have to be more careful about the drugs. In fact, in geriatric, we have this rule of thumb of eight years. Eight years for medication to be released to the public, to sit put, don't really push for it unless you really need it. And then at the eight years, there's enough complaints that the FDA removes it from the shelf. The Beers criteria was one of the major criteria that's published out there that lists uh, potentially uh, harmful medications in the geriatric population. It's got hundreds of medications. It's very hard. But it's one of the tools that we utilize to see whether or not it's appropriate to be using it. We have things like this for prescription medications. We don't have anything like this for supplements. And so that's why it's very dangerous. The, the biggest improvement is the fact that we've moved on and accepted it as a society to recognize these things and there's not more funding to study it. But as of right now, it's not regulated. I'm being told to rush. Uh, I promise I'll be in the back after this to answer some of your questions. So, uh, that the so now I'm going to switch gears and go into acupuncture. So acupuncture has it's, in the United States, it's, it's really an umbrella term, isn't it? When you think of acupuncture, you think about traditional Chinese medicine, uh, you think about all the things that I described in, you know, from my childhood. Uh, but it, oh, at the end of the day, acupuncture is this thin um, metallic needle. 
It's not blunted. It's not like the same needles that you think about when you're getting for a job. So it doesn't occur unless, you know, they want it to occur. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's based on, on this concept of, of, of energy which I'll go into. But it wasn't mainstream until 1971 when a New York Times reporter, James uh, Lesson, was covering a ping pong tournament in China. And he had an acute episode of appendicitis where they had to remove the earth. Uh, and after the surgery in China, he's like, oh, this is painful, give me meds, give me meds. And they came in and they poked him with three needles as fatigue points. Pain disappeared. He's like, how did this happen? I don't get it. And so he, he reported back to Nixon, and Nixon's like, that's not possible. So he sent a team of physicians to China to study it. And so that's when it started getting recognition in the United States. If you look at the latest 2000, well, the latest, you know, 2002 survey, the top five reasons for why acupuncture is used in the United States are for those listed uh, there. And I'm telling you right now, if that's why you're using acupuncture, you've got acupuncture completely wrong. You are missing out on what acupuncture is supposed to be doing for you. And if a physician says, you'll go acupuncture because you're back pain, it will help you with your back pain if done properly for some people. But that is limiting the use of acupuncture. Acupuncture is based on the idea of energy, right? The chi, you may have heard of it. The character for chi is made up of two characters. Uh, the top character being air, the bottom character being rice. And combined, it re represents this uh, uh, vital life force, a vivifying life force that represents the most crucial aspect of nourishment that you take into your body by breathing in and eating it. She runs throughout and through an entire body system through energy channels, which we refer to as meridians, the yin and yang meridians, which are further subdivided into multiple other circuits. It's, it's your source of vitality, it's a source of your characteristic. It's what supplies and, 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 and causes the organs to function together. Right? And if you really think about it, this, this concept of energy is, is prevalent throughout throughout different societies, cultures, history. Look at Greek literature and you'll see that the term pneuma is used a lot because they recognize that there's some form of air inside of every body that, that gives them life. You look at Indian yoga and you see chakra, right? Energy that's being put around. Homeopathic medicine calls it a vital force. Star Wars calls it a force. <laughs> there's something in there that we can't describe, but modern medicine can't quite grasp what it is. We, we say we lack energy, but that's, if there's no single real term to define what's actually happening inside. I know that for a fact because I can't do a Medicare building code for lacking energy. It doesn't exist. <laughs> there are many forms of energy, but the main energy that, that I want you to be more aware of is this concept of yon chi. Yon chi is the, is the premier energy. It's the energy that you were born with and inherited from your ancestors. Passed down through the chromosome. It's stored in the kidneys, and that's why in Chinese medicine, the kidney is the most crucial uh, organ in the body. It's stored in there, and it diminishes over time. Sound familiar? And as we age, you can't replenish it, but it gives source to all the other organs. Homeostenosis kind of rings a bell, doesn't it? So, I don't know, for the sake of this topic, you don't need to know everything that's happening. But the concept of acupuncture and chi is that the body is, in, is the energy is trying to be in constant homeostasis by circulating throughout the channels. It's in constant communication. Your body is a microcosm of the macroscopic world. It's in constant dynamic interaction between you and the world. And if that is in, in, if that is in balance, that's why you have to spend the symptoms. So, when an acupuncturist sees you, traditional Chinese medicine practicing acupuncturists, there's so many of them out there. When they see you, they're wondering, not on, they're not focusing on the symptom, they're, called, they're asking themselves, where is the blockage that's presenting itself in the back pain? When, a, 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 when the typical allopathic physician refers you to an acupuncturist and Medicare even photo store, right? Uh, to see an acupuncture they just back pain. But what if there's socioeconomic factors involved in disrupting your energy? Your mental status. What if your knee pain 
is just a reflection of something else that's going on in the rest of the body. And so the acupuncturist takes, this, takes a step back and says, what's really wrong with you? And how can I help you? And how can I restore that balance? That's, a, in my opinion, more of a holistic approach to medicine. Right? Many, of, many patients continue to complain that one, my doctor doesn't listen to me. Number two, my doctor doesn't let me talk. Number three, my doctor never even touched me. Sometimes when you see, I'm not, I'm not degrading orthopedic surgeons or anything like that, but if you have a knee problem, all they do is look at your knee and nothing else. What if the knee pain is a result of your hip pain? What if the hip pain is a result of your back pain? What if that back pain is simply due to the fact that you're not sleeping right because you're up at night because of anxiety? <coughs> Who's putting all of these things together and taking a step back and saying, how can I really help? There are elements, you have to go to four years of traditional Chinese medicine to understand it. And it's completely different from, from the way that Western medicine studies the body. I didn't go to TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, myself. I cheated. I did French acupuncture after studying four years of medical school and three years of residency. And they called it, and so I can legally say I do medical acupuncture, but I can't promote, promote myself as an acupuncturist. There are legal reasons for that, political reasons for that, too. But I just put this up there to help you see that. The spleen and the stomach are interconnected in terms of energy. There's no connection like that in, in, in Western medicine. Osteopathy, as I said before, is the, it was founded in the late 1800 by Dr. A.T. Stills, and he got frustrated because he was saying all of these doctors are just focusing on the symptoms and not looking at the root cause of the symptoms. What if, and, he, and so he studied the musculoskeletal system and the blood vessels and the lymphatic system and said, what if just because the body is not properly stored to its original place, that these disruptions are causing and manifesting, manifesting itself as these symptoms? So let's treat the body so that we give the body a chance to heal. So that's osteopathy. Osteopathy has certain points in the body where they say, you know what? Even though you have constipation, why is it that your right leg is hurting? And so, he, so they develop all these points called uh, Chapman's reflexes. And they discovered that there's certain hot spots that we should focus on. And what's interesting is there's no documentation to prove that Dr. Stone was ever exposed, or the, many of the founders were exposed to acupuncture. But when you lay the maps on top of each other, there's a lot of coincidences that Western medicine can't explain. And yet we do focus on them, and I see results. Ultimately, this comes down to the fact that how do we promote a healthy aging? We're in this conquest. Some people think aging is a disease, which I think that's sad. In the research world, the reason why they want to they want to promote aging as a disease is because you can get national grant funding for disease. Now I'm concerned. That's why research researchers want aging to be classified as disease. <laughs> there are you, you, you can open up and your Google is trying to cure the world by eliminating aging. Thank you, Google. If you talk to some people uh, throughout the world, you know they'll tell you what the secret to successful eating is. If you talk to Elizabeth at her 104th birthday, she said she drank three Dr. Peppers a day, and that's the only Dr. she knew. If you talk to Emma in Italy, she said the secret to longevity is two cookies and an egg every morning. And if you talk to Adele, she said not exercising helped her get to 114 years <laughs> Some of these, the reason why I bring this up is because of the fact that we haven't figured it out, but partly because of the fact that we haven't explored and had an open mind to see what the possibilities are. I'm not trying to say or promote this extreme end of do everything. Right now in the Bay Area, there's this thing called DNA hacking. And there's a lot of do-it-yourself Kids, I mean, my kids are watching YouTube of DIY or everything nowadays. But we're taking it to the extreme of one end. I'm not here to say that acupuncture cures cancer. I'm not here to say that Western medicine has answered for every cancer. I'm not here to promote one product over the other. I'm just saying, why can't we in the scientific community and in the general population just say, what if there is a possibility? And if it's safe and properly monitored, maybe we can use it appropriately to benefit from it. 
but it's not just in scientific community. I mean, I have a lot of patients, family members who are going home naturopath. My cousin's a naturopath. She thinks I'm a quack. <laughs> she said, all the medications you're using, it's dangerous, it doesn't do anything. And I say the same thing to her. I'm like, give me your evidence. She gives me a bunch of articles. And for every article she produces, I could provide a counter article. We could go back and forth and back and forth. But at the same time, I don't agree. I don't say, I don't completely say, don't do it. Okay, so I want to leave you with three points. One, if you're using any form, even prayer, let the physician know. What if prayer is working for you? That's great. I won't discourage it. But if the physician is discouraging you from praying and you're saying it's working, I don't know about that physician. If you're taking anything, look up the active ingredient. I told you that in the previous one of the studies that only two out of the 12 manufacturers produce their active ingredient. So it's hard to tell. Every time I talk to somebody who's getting products from online, I'm like, oh, I know this guy. He's always giving me the good stuff. For some reason, they're all in Mexico. <laughs> I guess Mexico has a better intent or intention for you, for, for, for us to buy. I don't know what it is, but if you get a product, just make sure you know what the active ingredient is and see how that active ingredient interacts with any of the conventional medications that you are taking. And consider for one point that it may not be the drug itself, but the interaction between the herbal supplement and the medication, or even the herbal and the herbal, may be causing your symptoms. And like I said, have an open mind. Don't be reckless. Don't go from one extreme to the other. Don't say, I'm only going to use Western medicine. Don't say, I'm only going to use Eastern medicine. Have an open mind. Thank you. So welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back, and thank you for continuing your participation in this, this really enjoyable event. And once again, thank you, Dr. Cho, for uh, your courtesy and staying for the Q&A. And thank you again to our audience participants for your courtesy um, in facilitating the Q&A uh, uh, process. Dr. Teresa Harbaugh is Executive Associate Dean at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at the University of California, Davis. An internationally recognized expert in gerontological nursing and nursing education. Dr. Harbaugh focuses her research on understanding and improving, improving the relationship between individuals with dementia and Alzheimer's disease and their family caregivers to improve home health care. Her topic, the aging brain. As a registered nurse, I've had the experience of working with individuals affected by dementia, inclusive of Alzheimer's. I'm sure many in this room can also attest to the challenges faced by those affected and those who care. So most certainly, this is a very, very important educational opportunity for all of us to understand what we might be able to expect as, a, as ourselves or what we might be able to expect and identify in those around us that we love. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Harbaugh. Good morning. this morning. Um, this is a topic that is um, near and dear to my heart as I age. I want to age well and I am always hopeful that my brain will um, age well with me. As I enter my 60th decade, I'm not quite sure whether or not um, that's going to be the case. Uh, so if I have memory problems during the talk today, please be kind to me. Um, so, uh, what I hope to achieve in the talk this morning is to describe the difference between fluid and crystallized intelligence so that we can understand um, some of the normal age-related changes that happen in our brain. Um, and then also to describe some ways to enhance uh, your cognition, uh, at least things that may work for some people. And I'm going to start with the quiz because I'm a teacher 
and so we'll see how you're going to do. So these are uh, true-false quiz. Um, so the majority of older adults, age 65 and older, have Alzheimer's disease. True-false. So according to the Alzheimer's disease facts and figures reports, it's more like 10 or 11 percent over the age of 65. It does increase in percentage as we age. Our risk for developing some form of dementia increases, um, but uh, it's the majority of older adults get to old age and age well without um, pathology. As people grow older, their intelligence declines significantly. That's false. Um, there are some circumstances uh, that are pathology related, but normal aging is not associated with um, instability or declines in our uh, previously achieved intellectual functioning. Um, it's difficult for older adults to learn new things. Can you teach an old dog new tricks? Yes, you can. Although our performance, we don't learn as efficiently as we did when we were younger adults. We can continue to learn new information. My mother is 87 years old, and she has a new iPhone. And although she says it is the bane of her existence, I'm really impressed with how she has learned to use it. She um, moved to a new city a couple of years ago, and Siri is her best friend in navigating. Um, and because she is my mother, she always thanks Siri for her help. <laughs> Personality changes with age. Yeah, less certain about this one. Um, false. So again, in normal aging, the personality remains consistent. And there are some disease processes, dementia is one of them, where we can see changes in um, the personality, and that may be an indicator that there's a disease going on. But we tend to be who we always were, maybe even a little bit, a little bit more so as we age. Yeah, the good and the bad. Memory loss is a normal part of aging. True. Yes. So there are considered. Um, benign senescence is a term that uh, used to be used. It means that as we age, there are some benign memory changes. They can be vexing, they are annoying, they happen at, at times that can be embarrassing when you're going to introduce somebody that you know well and their name just flies out of your brain as you start to do the introduction. Um, but those, while they are um, annoying and vexing, they're not considered uh, consistent with pathological changes because they don't interfere with our social and occupational functioning. And that notion about function is an important one in um, when we talk about geriatric medicine and about aging. And oftentimes things are seen as pathological at that point which they interfere with our ability to function normally in daily life. So there are normal changes that happen in the brain. These, um, the brain of a 27-year-old, the blue one, and the, uh, an 87-year-old. And what you can see is that like other organs in the body, the brain shrinks a little bit as we age. You see the, um, Thank you. 
And this is um, a picture of a healthy brain versus a brain with Alzheimer's disease. And so again, the atrophy or the shrinking of the brain is even more pronounced in Alzheimer's disease. And although there is somewhat of a connection between how much brain mass you've lost and the cognitive deficits that you will see, it's not a perfect correlation. And it's because um, for some of us, we've developed essentially collateral connections in our brains. And so um, sometimes we can continue to function even in the face of fairly significant pathological changes in our brain because the thoughts, the processes, the nerve impulses find different pathways to get through. And you see that even in Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, it's sort of like you have a, a, a lamp that has a frayed cord and you plug it in and it works and then you let go and it goes out and you touch it and it works because sometimes the electricity gets through and it's this um, collateral connectivity in our brain that allows it to continue to function or to function intermittently even in the face of um, disease. So intelligence um, has been divided into two different kinds. Uh, crystallized intelligence um, is thought to relate to that previously acquired knowledge that we have through the schooling, our education, through life experiences. It's all of that information that we've um, gotten stored and are able to access in our brain. Fluid intelligence really refers to how efficiently our brains are working how efficiently we are storing information and retrieving information. Um, people who do well on games like Jeopardy have very high fluid intelligence. They're not only smart, they also have a lot of crystallized intelligence, but they're able to retrieve that information very quickly. Um, and if it weren't a speed contest, contestants may um, compete more favorably, but those who have high fluid intelligence and are able to retrieve that information very quickly and efficiently, do better on tests that involve speed or timing. So I'm going to go through what are some of the normal um, changes that happen uh, uh, in our brains as we age. And again, although um, changes in intellectual functioning, both fluid and crystallized, have been demonstrated in um, some studies, the differences tend to be um, exaggerated by a research technique that uses cross-sectional instead of longitudinal uh, research design. And I'll show you um, what I mean by that. One of the best known studies that has been done is a longitudinal study called the Seattle Longitudinal Study. It had went on for decades following um, adults through to as they aged. And um, the cross-sectional analyses of that study suggested that our intelligence peaks in early adulthood and then starts to decline. In contrast, the longitudinal analyses of that very same study found that intelligence continues to grow into the 60s and 70s. Now this is the same study, same sample, different findings. Why is that? The reason is the the design of cross-sectional. So let's say, for example, we're starting a study in 1950, and we admit to that 130-year-olds, 140-year-olds, 150-year-olds, and 160-year-olds. The cross-sectional analyses compare those 30, 40, 50, and 60-year-olds with each other. And we see differences in their intellectual um, performance in part, we think, because of differences in their educational background. So people in 1950 who are 60, in their 60s, were educated at the turn of the century, before the turn of the century. And so the schooling wasn't as good. Some only may not have attended school. Um, they may have uh, quit at the third grade. And so we're going to exaggerate the differences that happen. When we follow those 30-year-olds from 1950 to 1990 and compare them, what we see is that there isn't a falling off. There isn't that dramatic difference between when they are 30 and when they're 70. They continue to make um, gains intellectually. So does that make sense about why 
it's important to understand how the data were collected and how they were analyzed so that we know whether or not um, we're comparing people who really should be compared. Because when we compare current 30-year-olds right now with current 90-year-olds, we're likely to see big differences um, in how they can perform, in part because um, 30-year-olds are used to taking the kinds of tests that we often administer in order to measure intelligence. They do have done that more recently than a 90-year-old. Another finding from the Seattle Longitudinal Study is that decrements in cognitive abilities do not, on average, occur prior to age 60. So again, I'm going to turn 60 this year. It means I'm sort of at my peak. <laughs> Um, however, reliable decrements in all cognitive abilities can be found by age 74. So there are some changes that happen in the brain, and we can document them. They don't tend to be of a large magnitude, but um, there, there are things that happen that affect how our brains work. By age 81, fewer than half show decline during the previous year. Pardon? In the previous seven years, sorry, thank you. It's also my glasses. I'm progressive, so I'm trying to get used to. Um, and part of this, again, is who gets to age 81, right? From, during, and who has not died in the previous seven years? Because it's those healthiest older adults who get to age 81. You don't get to age 81 unless you've gotten to age 80 or 74. So, um, but those who have health problems um, and, and don't survive to 81 means that those are the ones who we are likely to see changes in, those who have um, poorer health. And so um, it's not surprising that the magnitude of changes that we start to see after somebody has reached um, a, a, an older age start to decline simply because in order to live to old age, you have to have had better health. And we also know that some of the cognitive training that has been done can um, offset some of the decline in function, particularly in fluid intelligence. So you can um, keep your brain acting a little bit more quickly and efficiently through um, cognitive training. So again, most of the changes that we see in the aging brain occur primarily in fluid intelligence. And so um, we don't retrieve information as efficiently, as quickly. We don't store it as efficiently or as quickly. And so it may take repeated times to try and get something stored. Whereas a 20-year-old may remember a telephone number with just one repeating of it. It takes someone my age or someone older than me repeated times to, to get it to stick in our brains. Again, we sometimes see exaggerated differences in this because of um, time tests. And so when we give older adults plenty of time in order to complete the intelligence tests that we're measuring their intelligence on, they do better than if it's a time test. Makes sense, right? There are changes in memory that happen as we age, um, and they uh, are considered to be benign, meaning that they don't substantially interfere with our um, social or occupational functioning. The other interesting piece about this is that complaints of memory problems are not reliable indicators of actual memory deficits. So you can't go on somebody's complaints of memory problems alone to say, oh yeah, you know, my mom's been complaining of her memory, that means she must be having memory problems. Similarly, you can't rely on the lack of complaints of memory problems to be an indicator that there are no changes in someone's memory. Because some older adults, if they are noticing or having memory um, changes in their memory, they may not want to report that because they're concerned that it may be an early sign of a form of dementia. And it may be that they don't remember that they're having memory problems. <laughs> That's sort of meta memory. You remember what you, that you're forgetting. I have a friend who said, there are three things that I reliably have difficulty remembering. It's this, this, and I always forget the third one. <laughs> As we age, 
age, our ability to engage in multitasking diminishes somewhat. Turns out probably younger adults are not as good as multitasking as they would like to believe. But we do have more challenges when we try to divide our attention between two different things. Um, when I, I used to work um, at the Portland VA in the um, skilled nursing unit, and um, the, I would see the physical therapist and the kinesiotherapist working with older adults trying to teach them how to use a walker. And because these are therapists who enjoy working with older adults, they're often having conversations. And so you'd see the older adult with the walker step, they move their walker, take a step, answer the question, and answer the questions because learning something new, which is trying to figure out how to coordinate the sequence of walking with a walker and talking at the same time divides their attention and they're not as efficient. And so what I suggested to the kinesiotherapist is that they save the conversations for after the session, either before or after, but not while you're trying to teach somebody how to walk, because it may seem like it's a nice and social thing to do, but it can actually make it more difficult for them to learn how to use the walker. The good news, and there is a bit of good news, is that older adults may be able to compensate for some of the decrements that happen as we age um, because of what we tend to think of as wisdom. And it's that accumulated um, knowledge that we have over our, our lifetime, the experiences that we have, that can sometimes allow us to work more efficiently from a knowledge perspective. And um, the classic uh, research that's been done in this area was done with typists. And I know this is a group that knows what the typists are. Um, <laughs> my students don't always know what I mean when I talk about typists. Um, so some research was done looking at very experienced but older typists with younger, less experienced typists. And when they were asked to um, type nonsensical random text, the younger typists did much better than the older typists. But when they were asked to type text that made sense, the older typists caught up and were um, surpassed, particularly if it was complex text. And it's because they could anticipate what would come next and have their fingers ready. And so that's a, an accumulation of experience, wisdom, their expertise in typing overcame the advantage of, that the younger typists had in terms of sheer speed that was only demonstrated when it was random text. I love that study um, because I think it, it really helps us understand the importance of wisdom and experience. And as a nurse, as we look at the baby boom nurses getting ready to retire, it actually is a little concerning to me because there is going to be a retirement of wisdom in nursing and not just nursing, but um, in other disciplines as well that happens that we don't necessarily have um, a lot of younger nurses up to speed yet to, to take over. Um, and so I think we're, we're looking across the health disciplines about how we can continue to utilize um, our older health professionals in order to tap into their wisdom. Um, I think Dr. Cho made this um, point in his talk that even with advanced age, it's important to remember that there are considerable individual differences that can account for even more of the changes that we see in cognition as we age. Every year that we live, each experience that we have builds on our genetic makeup and causes us to be very different individuals. If you've met one 85-year-old, you've met one 85-year-old. The differences between 85-year-olds is vast, um, much more so than the differences between three-month-old babies. Um, and it's because of so much uh, different exposures that we've had over a lifetime. And so we can make generalizations about what happens every, as we age, but it's really important to know that individual differences are going to play a big role about what actually happens to you as an individual as you get older. 
Um, and again, you know, the big takeaway message, I think, is that although our brains do change as we age, they shrink, they become less efficient, what is normal, what is baseline for us, the absence of pathology, we should continue to have our normal intellectual function as we age. And we actually miss a lot of pathology among older adults because we tend to normalize memory problems or cognitive changes and we think of it as a normal part of aging when in fact it really isn't. And changes in cognition are an important symptom for us as health professionals to pay attention to because it likely means that there's something going on, that you're out of homeostenosis um, when, when you're demonstrating a severe enough cognitive deficit that it's interfering with your functioning. Um, a term that is gaining in popularity, um, how many of you have you heard of mild cognitive impairment? It's sort of um, increasing, it, it, it's uh, where dementia used to be at probably in the 70s and 80s, but mild cognitive impairment is one of those geriatric syndromes um, that reflects a change in cognition that is of significant magnitude that others are noticing it. The individual may be noticing it, family may be noticing it, and when we test that older adult, we can document objective changes in cognition. Um, function continues to be preserved, so again, my 87-year-old mother has what I think of as mild cognitive impairment. Um, she'll repeat herself uh, in a one-hour phone conversation. Um, she continues to function independently. She lives by herself. She has learned how to uh, drive to all the destinations she needs to in a, a new city. She's learned how to use an iPhone. So she continues to be independent, but we can measure the change that she's had in her memory. And um, it doesn't appear to be related to anything that could be reversible, um, but it's, it's obvious. Whether mild cognitive impairment progresses to dementia is unclear. We don't know yet. For some individuals, it will, and for others, it won't. And we don't yet understand what might be protective or what causes somebody's mild cognitive impairment to progress um, further to where it is causing some functional impairment. Dementia is a symptom complex that's characterized by intellectual deterioration of sufficient magnitude that it starts to interfere with social or occupational functioning. So again, it's that threshold that makes it now dementia. Um, the onset of dementia is pretty insidious, so somebody, it's often um, very difficult to pinpoint the exact time when somebody started to have symptoms of dementia. And usually what we see is after the diagnosis has been made, family members will say, I bet that's what happened when my dad didn't recognize his sister at that funeral. Um, and so they'll often retrospectively put the pieces together and say, boy, that might have actually been happening two years ago, three years ago. Um, it generally doesn't occur until after age uh, 65. There are forms of Alzheimer's disease that are um, early onset, that, that they start before age 65. They tend to be um, a more genetically uh, run in families kind of disease and have a much more aggressive um, nature and decline happens more quickly than in the dementias that happen later in life. Um, all dementias are um, progressive. There is a decline over time, but the rate can vary um, from months to years. Common signs and symptoms of dementia include memory impairment. That's probably the hallmark sign that most of us um, think about with dementia. But there's also impaired abstract thinking, um, impaired judgment. This is where you'll see personality changes. Sometimes for the better, often not. <laughs> um, I, 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 
have a, a friend whose father, um, as an adult, was um, very impacted by his war experience and suffered from PTSD. And he was very paranoid and very harsh, um, very rigid. And as he got demented, as his dementia progressed, he became this kind, thoughtful, sweet man. And my friend often thought that this was who he might, maybe would have been had he not gone to the war. But um, that sort of personality change in dementia, unfortunately, is rare. And um, most often, what we see are um, the kinds of personality changes that are more difficult to manage. There's also language impairment that happens, and as the disease progresses, that gets worse. Um, apraxia is a term that means we forget how to do things. So dressing involves sequencing, and somebody with dementia can get the sequence wrong in dressing and put underwear on over their clothes. Um, and then behavioral symptoms are uh, one of the hardest categories of symptoms for families um, to manage. They include things like um, asking uh, repeated questions, um, wandering, um, hiding or hoarding things, being uh, paranoid um, about whether you're out to get their money. Um, there are a number of different forms of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is probably the most well-known and the most common form. What we actually see in the brain are what's called amyloid plaques. These are deposits of, of proteins in the brain that interfere with um, brain function. We also see neurofibrillary tangles, and what that means is that normally our nerve system, you know, it, they, they work very healthy, they, they're streamlined, and in the context of Alzheimer's disease, they get kind of shriveled up and all entangled with each other. Um, there's also what's called granulovacular degeneration, and if you remember on the slide that um, I showed of the crosscut of brains, it's those big um, areas of blank spot in the brain. So those get bigger um, as uh, the Alzheimer's disease progresses. Um, we don't have a definitive way of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease before somebody dies. Um, it's only a confirmed diagnosis on autopsy. But we have gotten clearer about the diagnostic criteria and um, someone may carry the diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's disease. That's, that means that there isn't any evidence of cardiovascular um, disease and there has been an insidious as opposed to a more abrupt onset. Um, and when you rule out all other causes for the cognitive changes that you've seen, probable Alzheimer's disease is the diagnosis that you land on. For individuals where you've ruled most everything out, um, but there may be some cardiovascular disease or um, there may be a mixed uh, etiology or an abnormal course of it, they may carry the diagnosis of possible Alzheimer's disease. And it just means that we're less certain about what it is. Another form of dementia is Lewy body dementia. Um, it also has a gradual progression, um, though it tends to be a little bit more rapid than Alzheimer's disease. In Lewy body dementia, you'll see fluctuations um, in cognition. And um, there will also be persistent and well-formed visual hallucinations. You may also see some symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease, and there may be a history of frequent falls. And, um, that's consistent with Lewy body dementia. The fluctuations in cognition can be difficult for family members because it leads to the idea that maybe they know what they're doing and that they're just faking it. And I have to tell you, I have never met an older adult who has wanted to be seen as more demented than they are. <laughs> um, and so uh, I don't think we as humans fake having some problem with our brain. It's just, I, I, I don't think it's in how, how we're programmed uh, to exist. Another form is multi-infarct or vascular uh, dementia. Um, this is, uh, we don't have really good diagnostic criteria of when to decide that somebody has a vascular dementia, how 
much uh, vascular disease, what are the risk factors, what, you know, how many um, infarcts in the brain have to exist before uh, you would call it a vascular dementia. So we lack clarity there. But what it is, is it's a form of dementia that we see in patients who do have cardiovascular um, disease. They may have had a stroke or a history of TIAs. Are you familiar with TIAs, transient ischemic attacks? Those are those sort of like mini strokes that looks like the person just sort of blinks out for a little bit. And then there's no residual, you don't see drooping, there's no um, changes, no paralysis with that. What you see in vascular dementia, because it seems to be associated with um, stroke or the TIAs, is sort of a stepwise progression. And if you can address the underlying vascular disease, you may be able to stop the progression or slow down the progression um, in uh, vascular dementia. Frontotemporal dementia, also progressive decline with atrophy of the frontal or temporal lobes. And this is where there will be insidious personality changes and maybe not so obvious cognitive changes so that you may not see the memory problems that you see in the other forms of dementia. Instead, you may see an apathy, just this disinterest in anything. Um, you may see disinhibition. And so somebody who would never use foul language before may start swearing because they're not shutting that button off um, the way that most of us do in um, social situations. You may see somebody who starts being more flirtatious, who um, actually uh, starts propositioning somebody else for um, sexual uh, favors. And so those are very disturbing changes that can happen, especially for adult children to watch this happen in their parents. Um, you'll also see poor judgment. And the, this is often the pathology behind when you hear those stories of somebody who gambled away all of their life savings kinds of things where it was really poor judgment and a very different sort of behavior that happens um, than what we typically think of how that person um, functions and runs their life. There are some fortunately rare but rapidly progressing dementias Hicks disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. This is the mad cow disease. Um, again, we don't understand a lot about that. Um, it creates this sort of spongy brain, spongiform brain that you can actually see on uh, scans. And um, like I said, I have seen maybe one case of um, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. It's one where there can be a reluctance to do an autopsy because we don't yet know if it's contagious and whether the pathologist risks something in uh, doing a pathology in, in these, uh, this mad cow disease uh, context. And so, um, like I said, fortunately, it, it's a pretty rare form. Um, treatments for dementia, I think Dr. Cho mentioned, it's not curable. We don't have a cure for Alzheimer's disease. There are, however, some um, things that we can do that may um, enhance cognition or slow the um, rate of progression. And there are certainly things that we can do that put the um, older adult with dementia in sort of the best environment um, possible for their brain to function. Um, sometimes we will see dysfunction in somebody with Alzheimer's disease that actually is exaggerated beyond what we would expect given the amount of cognitive impairment that they have. And it's because sometimes we put them in environments that are very difficult for them to navigate. Um, hospitals are particularly um, unhospitable to older adults, particularly older adults with dementia. And when you think about it, that's the place where we often make decisions about whether or not somebody can return home after um, an illness condition. And we're making that evaluation in probably the worst context possible. And we would come up with a much better decision about that if we were looking at how they were functioning in their own home. Um, so, um, like I said, there are some medications that can be um, given that can slow the progression um, of um, Alzheimer's disease. We can also do a lot with symptom management. 
One of the things that we do in patients with um, dementia, with older patients in general, um, in spite of the opioid crisis that we have in this country, for older adults, we tend not to treat their pain very effectively or adequately, particularly following things like a hip fracture or hip surgery. Somebody with dementia often will have their pain medication withheld following surgery, and they may develop a delirium based on the pain. And in fact, the older adults with Alzheimer's disease can tolerate um, opioid analgesics in moderate doses. Um, the problem you have to do is manage the constipation because that can also cause delirium. But some of the um, uh, cognitive impairment that we see in um, particularly hospitalized patients is a delirium that's superimposed on a dementia. And so um, we're exaggerating the, um, their functional impairment um, because we haven't uh, adequately treated their pain, their low sodium, um, their oxygenation, they may be dehydrated. And if we treat those things, we can improve their um, function a little bit. Depression is another thing that we don't adequately treat in older adults, particularly older adults with um, dementia. And they can benefit from uh, uh, treatment of depression. There are also medications that can help reduce some of the psychotic symptoms, particularly in the um, Lewy body dementia. And, and that can um, provide more comfort for the, the individual and for the family. There are a number of non-pharmacological um, treatments that are being tested to see if they have any um, effect for uh, older adults with dementia. Um, psychosocially, um, having uh, social interactions uh, seems to be helpful. Social isolation tends to exaggerate uh, the decline that we see. And we can see social isolation um, that happens even in the context of people being around for older adults who have hearing impairments. Um, we're starting to get a better understanding that when you don't hear the conversation that's going on around you, it can increase your cognitive impairment. Um, my mom resisted hearing aids for a long time, saying, nobody has said anything that's worth $3,000. <laughs> That's probably true, <laughs> except we had a family reunion, and um, all 10 of her children were there, and all 20 of her grandchildren were there, and she missed a lot of the conversations, or kept saying what, and couldn't hear what the youngest grandchildren were saying. And after that weekend, I said, that weekend was worth $3,000. She now has hearing aids, and she, they are working for her. And I understand all of the problems around hearing aids and that they are not a panacea for everyone. And, um, but we have to recognize that hearing loss can result in a form of social isolation that contributes to cognitive impairment. Um, we can also uh, improve the quality of life of people with dementia by doing what I call going along. When somebody has uh, dementia, they may say that today is Tuesday. And I can argue with them. I can show them a calendar. I can show my phone that says today is Saturday. And all I've done is proved a worthless point to that person. And if they want to think today is Tuesday and there isn't a problem with today being Tuesday, then I'm not going to argue with them. Um, I used to have students on a dementia care unit uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and there was an older woman there who, after dinner, every week, would take some of the other old ladies on a hike because she thought she was at camp. <laughs> now, if you're on a dementia care unit and you think you're at camp, I say go for it. <laughs> who am I to convince you that I have a better reality for you? Lily Tomlin, I think, says that reality is nothing more than a collective hunch. And um, I think sometimes overrated. And, and, and I joke about that, but, but I, you know, I think sometimes we believe we have to, we have a duty to orient this person to reality. And it comes naturally. 
the very you know, first clinical that nursing students go into, if they encounter somebody with dementia, the first thing they want to do is reality orientation. And I'm not for um, in favor of not orienting someone if they're asking for that, or of casually inserting information so that they understand the context of the interaction. Um, so when I go to have an interaction with somebody who has dementia, I introduce who I am. I say I'm a nurse. It may not always be obvious um, to them based on what I'm wearing that I'm a nurse. And I don't assume if I leave and come back that they're going to remember that. And so I will reestablish the context of our interaction. But I think that's very different and a gentler way of keeping the person oriented to the situation than it is when I try and argue. You know, I, I've heard um, medical students and nursing students arguing with somebody, you know, saying, Gladys, you're 98 years old. If your mother was alive today, she'd be 118. <laughs> There is nothing about that conversation that is reassuring to Gladys. <laughs> and usually they're shouting it. I didn't shout in deference to the woman down here, but usually um, it is shouted at the person even if they may not have hearing impairment. It's that kind of reality orientation that I think is very jarring. Now I won't lie to Gladys if she asks me where her mother is. But I will say I haven't seen her. That is the truth. I don't assume she's dead, you know, especially, especially as we live longer, you know. You know. Gladys is, you know, 75 years old. Her mother may still be alive. Um, but I will ask Gladys, tell me about your mother. When is the last time you saw your mother? What kind of a relationship did you have with your mother? And often Gladys will get to the place where she said, oh yeah, and she died in blah, blah, blah. That is a much gentler way of orienting. The other thing I may find out is that this isn't about Gladys's mother. That this is, you know, for, for many people, not all, for many people, mother may be a symbol for, I want something that's familiar, I want something that makes me feel secure, and so I think sometimes we have to read between the lines with somebody with dementia. When they're talking to us, their words may be sending a different message than the one that we're interpreting. And so by asking questions and not making assumptions about what they mean when they're using what we know are probably impaired language skills, then we might find out more that help us to interact with that person in a more therapeutic, more effective way. Environmental modification is another thing that we can do that can support um, the functioning of someone with dementia so that they're in a more supportive environment. Um, and I'm not referring to the things like removing pro rugs and um, changing where the electric cords are for tripping hazards, those are good too. Um, but rather understanding in what way is the environment creating um, too much stress for the person. So if we all visit on Sunday and there's a lot of conversation, that might not be helpful. And smaller groups of people with um, one conversation going on may be a way to control the environment in a way that allows that person to interact more effectively. Um, instead of having an argument over the car, one might remove the car keys or somehow disable uh, the function of the car or the keys. Um, having locks on doors that aren't in your usual line of vision, so a, a lock that's way down below or way high or a lock that requires two simultaneous functions can help keep somebody in a house who has a tendency to leave the house. So thinking about how to arrange the environment. I had a caregiver tell me um, one time that she had a hard time getting her husband to bed at night because in their living room they had a mirrored wall and he would see her reflection and his reflection and think that they had guests over. And you couldn't go to bed until your guests leave. Um, and she really struggled with trying to stand him in front of the mirror and say, you know, 
this is you, this is your reflection. He didn't recognize himself. That's really the ultimate disorientation to self when you don't recognize who you are in the mirror. And I suggested that perhaps she put curtains over the mirror, um, but she thought it would ruin the effect of the living room. Um, the mirror made it look bigger. Um, a different caregiver, I got that idea because a different caregiver said, you know, my grandmother, when she sees her image in the mirror, she thinks somebody is invading the apartment. When she sees Oprah Winfrey on TV, she thinks Oprah has stolen her money and she, you know, she'll have these fits. And so she moved the TV into her bedroom so that her grandmother couldn't watch that. And she took the mirror in the bathroom down so that when she went into the bathroom, she didn't see her image in the mirror. So she intuitively understood what to do to change the environment to be more supportive. I talked to one man who told me that he put yellow stickies on the cupboards in his kitchen to try and help his wife be able to function in there. And so I asked him to show it to me when I was doing a home visit. And I walked into the kitchen and it was sort of this yellow sticky bow. <laughs> and this is a case of too much stimulation. And um, there were yellow stickies everywhere. And I mean, it was disorienting for me, and I didn't even have a 60-year-old brain at that time. And, and so I think um, understanding what's the right level and what are you having the goal, what is your goal here? And I think for people with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease, the goal is to enhance the quality of life and to decrease anything that is going to detract from quality of life um, for that person. And so... Um, again, if you think you're at camp when you're in an assisted living facility, go for it. I hope to be that person when I'm in an assisted living facility. My advanced directives actually say, if I am the belle of the ball, which of course I would want to be, <laughs> don't mistake that for quality of life. So there are some things that you can do to reduce the risk of cognitive uh, decline. One is to not have cardiovascular or other chronic diseases. So, you should have started a while back. Um, all seriousness, um, there are, you can continue to reduce the risk um, as you age by getting in better cardiovascular health and if you have diabetes, getting your diabetes under better control because you will increase your um, vascular health and that will help with vascular dementia, but we also think there may be a vascular link to Alzheimer's disease, and so it may help there as well. Have a favorable socioeconomic status. Um, that also helps people who um, have a higher socioeconomic status tend to have um, lower risk for dementia. And it's not quite clear um, what that is. The Nunn study, um, if you're familiar with that, it, it, it's a, a very interesting um, body of work that has looked at aging nuns um, who have had sort of a similar exposure to socioeconomic status throughout their life. They've had you know, similar access to education, similar access to food and housing. Um, and um, one of the things that we learned from the nun study is that those who had a richer vocabulary earlier in life, so at high school, um, tended to maintain their function better. And so um, it's that having that collateral connectivity in your brain. So um, we think that may have something to do with it. Um, involvement in a complex and intellectually stimulating environment. And this needs to be novel stimuli. I get the question a lot, well, you know, my mom works crossword puzzles all the time. You know, is that going to help her? Um, to the extent that, yeah, I mean, that may help some, certainly, but it's not necessarily novel if she's been doing it for a long period of time. And so figuring out what are different ways of challenging the brain are important. Um, and to um, continue to try to learn something um, is a way to keep your brain active. It is, you know, the use it or lose it um, with your brain as well. Um, flexible personality style at midlife uh, is also associated with uh, lower rates of cognitive decline. And so I am working on increasing the flexibility of my personality style. 
you know, unfortunately, it's one of those things that you can't do a lot of good self-assessment on. You need feedback from others. And if you don't have a flexible personality style, you're not likely to take kindly to somebody coming out. Here's one, high cognitive status of your spouse. I am not suggesting that you trade up. <laughs> Um, maintenance of high levels of per um, perceptual processing speed. So, um, Lumosity, uh, some of you may be familiar with that website. There's an app you can download. There are different cognitive stim apps that you can do that may help you um, enhance your uh, cognitive processing speed. Um, I've tried it just to see, and you know, I went from having uh, on the first uh, assessment test they did a cognitive brain age of like 57, and then after a couple of weeks of practice, I got down to 28. <laughs> then I wanted to go to a kegger. And, <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, there are some things that you can do that will enhance the efficiency. And cognitive training seems to um, be something that may be worth trying in the context of a normal aging brain. And it has been tested in Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And you can, um, with intensive cognitive testing of somebody with Alzheimer's disease, you can demonstrate a paper increase. So we can document that somebody makes a one or two point improvement on the cognitive test but it doesn't translate into functional improvement. And I'm very cautious about, um, I am I, I, cautious about encouraging families to do this with somebody in, who has dementia because I think the potential for abuse um, and it is great there in a desire to help this person. Um, I, I talked to a caregiver one time who whose husband would hide his wallet because he was very paranoid, and then he would accuse her of stealing his money. Um, this was a second marriage for both of them, and they had agreed to keep their finances uh, somewhat separate in their marriage, and he wasn't paying his share of the bills that he had agreed to pay, and it was a constant source of friction between the two of them. And so she, on her own, decided that she would work with him on learning where to put his wallet. And so she'd take the wallet, put it in the dresser drawer. Am I running out of time? Oh, all right. I'm almost done. Okay. <laughs> Why, thank you. Um, so she would take the wallet, put it in the drawer, you know, say, here's your wallet, put it in the drawer, and say, now where's your wallet? He wouldn't know. So she'd open the door, take the wallet out, show it, do it. So she was doing this every day for a couple of weeks. And I said, any sign yet? She said, no, no, still hasn't worked. And I thought, you know, if he remembers anything, it's the last time I saw my wallet, you had it in your hand. <laughs> and, and I worry that, you know, that we can foment really some difficult interactions or difficult expectations. Again, I think sometimes families struggle with whether or not this person really is as severely demented as they seem to be in some situations. You know, one daughter told me, when she goes to the clinic to see her doctor, she's just fine. But then when she gets home, then all of this starts. And so I really wonder, is it just this cat and mouse game she's playing? And I, th I think what it is, is that she does everything she can to, you know, bolster her energy so that when she's out in public, you know, social skills remain intact for somebody with dementia far longer than other aspects of their cognition. And I think that it's that she's pulling it together in that situation and then the cost of that was significant. And, you know, again, that concept of homeostenosis, she doesn't have the reserve to maintain that all of the time. And it's a safe place, presumably, to do that at home. Um, and so I, I am, like I said, I'm cautious. I don't want to set family members up for an expectation that if this person just works hard enough, they can stave off the progression of the disease because we don't have any evidence to suggest that that's true. 
Um, some other things that some research, um, again, suggests cognitive training, a healthy diet, to the extent that, it, again, that it helps our cardiovascular health and keeps our diabetes intact, that can contribute to um, healthier aging brain, cardiovascular training, exercise, diet and exercise, right? Um, it's the age-old uh, prescription, but a good one. Um, and a healthy uh, social interaction uh, are also important. Sometimes as we age, our world becomes a little bit smaller. Transportation may be um, more difficult. Mobility issues may um, interfere. But it's still important for us to have quality social interactions. Um, I have a, a, a student who was interested in looking at social isolation that occurs in congregate care environments among older adults with hearing impairment. Again, we can think that if there are people around that somebody's not socially isolated, but if you're not hearing the conversation, you can continue to um, feel isolated. So, that's it.
think you should be able to like put the person in an MRI or something where you can see things in the brain. And then what you see it all tangles and different things. Thank you for that question. So there is a diagnostic workup that is um, recommended before you come to a diagnosis of dementia. Um, I, what, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to clarify. You can't confirm that it's Alzheimer's disease without finding the plaques and the tangles. And the only way to do that is when you autopsy the brain. You can't, we don't have uh, imaging that's powerful enough to uh, get to that cellular level in the brain. Um, having said that, there is a diagnostic workup that should be done um, that can, and it's designed primarily to rule out everything else that could cause dementia. And so, uh, physical exam, lab tests that look for signs of anemia, signs of um, that your uh, electrolytes are out of balance, a chest x-ray, some sort of brain imaging, and that's to rule out whether it's hydro, um, normal pressure hydrocephaly, whether there's a tumor, you can, you can look for vascular changes in the brain, and you may see atrophy of the brain um, on the imaging that you do, but that's not enough to say this is confirmably called Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease has very specific, it's called histological changes that you can only see under a microscope when you take a slice out of the brain. But you can get a pretty firm uh, diagnosis that this is an irreversible dementia. Um, and I can't impress enough the importance that it come on the basis of a comprehensive diagnostic workup. One of my former students is a nurse practitioner in Alaska and um, had a patient who came to her who'd been diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease. He, this was sort of a Hail Mary pass. He was asking, you know, could you just take a look, you know, one more time to make sure? And, you know, she looked at his medical records and thought it had been a pretty thorough workup that said, sure, and started with a health history. And in the health history, found out that he'd done a lot of hunting and fishing. And so she did a heavy metal screen, which is not typically part of the workup, and um, found out she thought mercury because of the fishing. Turns out it was lead. He had through the roof lead levels. That's a rare finding, but if that's your family member or if that's you, that's a really, and so we can treat lead poisoning and she started chelation and he improved significantly. And so having a thorough workup and not just going on the basis of age and cognitive impairment is really important before you land on a diagnosis of dementia. Thank you for that question. Right over here, Dr. Harvey. Your brain falling is um, something that's normal, you know, uh, getting smaller. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. I'm also a nurse and I was, I was stressed to see um, also what you said about um, the older nurses. I've been retired now for 10 years and I was in the hospital and it was kind of stressed to see some of the care I was getting by. Multiple forms of dementia. 
And um, it's also common with the benign senescence that's not considered pathology. That's the annoying and vexing change in our brain where our short-term recall um, can function more poorly in part because we may not have registered that new information um, efficiently, if at all. So in order for us to remember something, we have to um, think about it and then store it in our brain and then be able to recall it back and know where we filed it. And so sometimes our short-term memory, um, it's sort of like the last in is the first to go. Uh, and um, it was a last in, first out, LIFO. Uh, so, uh, and long-term memories were laid down in our brain at a time when it was functioning really well and at its peak. And so that may be why we recall it better. And we've also had more opportunity to recall those long-term memories. And so we've sort of ingrained those neural pathways. They're, it's a more efficient road. There are fewer potholes on the road to bringing that back. Everyday words. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so that tip of the tongue phenomenon, that these are words that you should be able to know and names of people that you should be able to know. And that can be part of just normal aging, not as efficient in the recall. Oops. Sorry. I, I, or, or it can be when it starts to really interfere and when other changes happen. So if that's the only change that you're experiencing is the word finding, it's called that tip of the tongue, I had it and now it's gone, the name. If that's the only symptom, it's probably just that normal age-related change in memory. If it's accompanied by other cognitive changes, uh, and particularly if they are starting to interfere with our ability to function independently, it may be a symptom of something more serious that warrants investigation. Is that? Next question right there. Here. Yes. Um, could you uh, talk about ADHD in older people and how you distinguish between that and um, other, well, and dementia? No. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, a and uh, in part, it's, that's not my area, but in part, I don't know that I've ever encountered an older adult who's been diagnosed with ADHD. And not that it doesn't exist, but it's not a diagnosis that people of the current older generation would necessarily have gotten. It's a, a newer diagnosis. And so, let me just think for a minute. Um, because it is uh, already an impairment in, in attention, and we know that attention is a normal, normally declines, our ability to divide our attention normally declines with aging, it may be likely that you would see increased symptoms of ADHD as, as the person gets older if they already have baseline attention deficit problems. But I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not aware of any research in this area, and I'm speaking outside the bounds of my knowledge, really. But interesting question. I enjoyed your nursery comments and story. Wonderful. My question is this. At the Box Center announcer, increasingly, you hear a lot about the importance of sleep and the cleansing of the brain that occurs during sleep. Mm -hmm. And you hear these practical suggestions. And I wonder, my question, any of the practical things people are saying at this meeting, such as a day of fasting, or if not fasting, don't eat from 7 at night or 7 in the morning. In other words, avoiding food, uh, which allows further cleansing of the brain. Anything in your practice? To this. Yeah, I don't know about that. You know, I'm more familiar with uh, the sort of probably the sleep recommendations that I assume you might have heard last week that it's important for that cleansing sleep that you cycle through all of the cycles and part of that is time in REM sleep. And what we know about older adults is that they their sleep quality can be interfered with because of other changes that happen with aging.
changing um, urinary frequency, uh, sleep apnea, uh, other kinds of things can interfere with the quality of sleep. And for some older adults, you may have, um, what you may notice is that you're not getting the same uninterrupted sleep, but if you can get the same amount of sleep and cycle through, that may be sufficient. So it's not like you have to sleep for you know, eight, 10 hours uninterrupted. So naps that allow you to get into that deep sleep may also be useful. Um, but I'm not familiar, like Dr. Cho, I'm not familiar with the Buck Institute and what's coming out of that. We have just two more questions with your courtesy. And was there somebody right here? Yes, sir. You're next, and then Matt, you are, you are next. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Orbach. Uh, my question has to do with the uh, body-brain barrier. The and body -brain barrier? the hippocampus, uh, the center of memory. Mm -hmm. And uh, your comments on um, research by Dr. Weiss Corey on young blood for old brains. Can you comment on that? I cannot. I'm sorry, that's outside my area of expertise. I'm not familiar with that research. Thank you. Uh, hello. Could you please just talk a little bit more about what you mean by... Where is the question? I'm here. Ah, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I have poor directional hearing. Um, what you mean by cognitive training? Mm -hmm. Yes, so there, um, it's a, a field that's growing, and some of it is based on some fairly sound uh, neuroscience research that if you challenge the brain, so um, there are lots of different um, activities, and if you, there are apps you can get for your phone or for your iPad. Uh, Lumosity has a website, and part of it you can access freely. The New York Times used to run some of the Lumosity uh, things when they're online. And what they are are things that challenge your brain. So um, I have Lumosity on my iPad, and one of the activities is that um, there are these trains that are different colored, and they're going on tracks, and you have to move the tracks so that the red train goes to the red barn, and the blue train goes to the blue barn, and it gets more complicated with the tracks weaving, and Brain's coming at different speeds, and so it really is challenging your brain to concentrate. Um, and, and, and so these apps usually are um, challenging particular ways in which your brain functions. So either you have to have, um, your, it's challenging your attention, it's challenging your concentration, it's challenging your word knowledge, it's challenging your mathematic ability, and um, in doing so, and having it often in a speeded version, there's some research that suggests that you improve the efficiency. It's kind of like you keep the roadway clear for your thinking to happen. And, you know, you can, when you use that app, you can document, you can see that the more you practice, the better you will get. Whether that will bring you happiness and improve your quality of life, First, it will bring you frustration, <laughs> and maybe that's good for the brain, too. Um, but does that make sense? So these are things that um, are essentially challenging your brain in perhaps novel ways that everyday life doesn't in order to enhance and maintain the speed of, and efficiency of the processing, that fluid intelligence. Great, thank you again very much.